Okay, well it is 6.05, so we will go ahead and get started and hopefully others will join us as we go through tonight's lesson on part two on how to identify the Church of the New Testament. So here is the whole picture of what we discussed last Sunday evening. Who do men say that I am? Well, some say that you are Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon of Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven revealed it to you. And I say that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 through 18. Folks, that is the promise. Based upon Peter's great confession that he made of Jesus being the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus made the promise that he will build his church. And when that church was built, it was built on the day of Pentecost of Acts chapter 2. And so from there on out, how is it that we can identify the church of the New Testament? Well, that promise is the New Testament church of Acts chapter 2, verse 47, as I stated. And then so, throughout time, what is it that can help us identify the church of the New Testament? Seeing that we live here in the 21st century, we look around and we see so many quote-unquote churches. And a lot of people often ask the question, why are there so many churches? Which church is the right church? Is it okay for you to attend whatever church that you want to? Well, last week, we obviously answered it, that question, that last question, with a no. You can't join the church that you want to join. The most important question that we need to be asking is, which church does God want me to be a part of? Well, that answer is the church of the New Testament. And so then that brings us to this question, well, how can I identify the Church of the New Testament here in the 21st century? Well, we find and are able to identify the Church of the New Testament when we open up the New Testament Scriptures. So if we are wanting to be the New Testament Church, then I would assume that the best thing for us to do would be to go to the New Testament and see what it is that the Church all did. And so... Our main idea to help identify the Church of the New Testament is that we need to understand that Jesus built only one church. Jesus built one church. He does not say churches plural. It says church singular. One church that he promised to build, in which he did build on the day of Pentecost of Acts chapter 2. And last week, we looked in our part one uh, lesson on how to identify the church in the New Testament is that, number one, the church had a pattern to follow. The New Testament church had a pattern to follow. And it still does today in the 21st century. And we looked at three patterns that are found within the scripture that the church followed. Number one, the, the pattern of leadership. We understood from the scriptures of Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus says, my church expressing ownership, he is the one who's the head. That's how the leadership begins, is that number one, he is the head. Head meaning that he has dominion, he has control, he has the authority. And Paul says that Christ, as being the head, the one with authority, he is the one that dictates on what he wants the church, which is his body, to do. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, 23, and 24. We then understand that within the pattern of the New Testament, he laid out the leadership within the church of elders. So Christ is the head, and then a set of elders. And to meet those qualifications of the elders in 1 Timothy chapter 1, or chapter 3, verse 1 through 7, and then Titus chapter 1. And then there are the deacons. And the deacons 
are men, specific men, who meet the qualifications of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 through 13, and they are ordained to a specific task within the church, such as the task of maintenance. It could be uh, the task of um, technology, uh, the task of running the church website, uh, the task of treasury, and so forth. We then understand that there's the pattern of worship that the church practice. Five acts of worship that we see the church practicing when they assemble together on the first day of the week. The preaching, the giving, the praying, the Lord's Supper, and the singing. After discussion of that, we then look at there's a pattern of salvation. Throughout the book of Acts, we see a pattern on how people were saved and added to the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ. And it all began on the day of Pentecost, when they heard the word. After they heard Peter's message, they were pricked to the hearts. And they asked men and brethren, what shall we do? So obviously their belief led them to ask that question, with Peter giving them the answer of repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And then we see that about 3,000 on that day obeyed the gospel. They heard the word, they believed, they repented, and they were baptized into Christ Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 46 of Acts. So then after looking at the pattern that the church has to follow, we imitate that same pattern today. If we want to call ourselves the church in the New Testament, we need to imitate, follow that same pattern. The pattern of leadership, the pattern of worship, and the pattern of salvation if we claim to be the church of the New Testament. So now, in part number two, we're going to be looking at how the church has a purpose to fulfill. Not only did the church have a pattern to follow, but the church of the New Testament has a purpose to fulfill. The book of Acts shows what the Lord's church is to do. It is a record of how the apostles carried out the great commission which the Lord left for them to accomplish. Therefore, finding out what the apostles led the New Testament church to do reveals what the Lord expects of his church in every generation. And so, what purpose did the church have? What purpose does the church still have today? What purpose is the church to fulfill? Well, specifically, there are three main purposes that we see in the New Testament on the, uh, what the church has to fulfill. Purpose number one is that the church is to teach the lost. This would be evangelism. Purpose number one that the church has to fulfill, the New Testament church has to fulfill, is to teach the lost. To teach the lost means to evangelize. The apostles set the earliest examples teaching daily in the temple. When you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves daily to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to the prayers, to the fellowship. And then when you later on scroll down and get to verse 46, 46 says, And they continued daily in the temple. I find that interesting. They met on the first day of the week as commanded. But then they also met Monday through Saturday. That's what daily means, folks. Daily means every single day. And so at times I kind of get a little bit irritated, uh, irritated in a, in a patient way, I would say. Whenever I hear people just complain about, oh, well, it doesn't say that we have to go on Sunday night. It doesn't say that we have to go on Wednesday night. And I just laugh it off and I just tell them saying, you know, you're right. Because guess what? <laughs> they met every single day. So good idea. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. We'll go ahead and just start meeting every single day now. How about that? Well, that's what they did in the New Testament. And before you know it, this practice converted thousands of souls. 
It converted thousands of souls. Specifically, it converted 3,000 souls. Verse 41 of Acts chapter 2. Before long, it also resulted in their being forbidden to teach anymore in the name of Jesus. But the apostles refused to honor these demands. Acts chapter 4, verse 17 through 19. So they continued to teach and share the word of God boldly, even while suffering many beatings. Acts chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. Persecution against the church at this time continued to rise. It came to the point that many of the, uh, the disciples had to quit their jobs. They had to leave their jobs and homes and flee the city of Jerusalem. But here's the interesting thing. During their time of fleeing, what were they doing? They were spreading the message of the gospel. Acts chapter 8, verse 1 through 4. By this time, several years had passed since the day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2. But Luke continued to record constant activity in the teaching of the gospel. Jesus had charged the apostles to preach the gospel and Acts records how they accomplished this task. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, Paul's teaching that the church is the fullness of Christ provides an understanding that the church is to do what Jesus would be doing if he were still on the earth. The first century church practiced this, folks. They practiced and teaching the lost wherever they went. They were teaching it when they had to flee. But now for us, we necessarily don't have to flee. But at times, you know, we like to go out on vacation. Well, if they were able to teach the gospel while fleeing from persecution, how is it that we sometimes can't teach the gospel when we are relaxing on vacation? The first century church practiced this, and Jesus expects his church in the 21st century to practice this as well. So the question that we need to be asking ourselves is, are we teaching the lost? Emphasis on we. Are we teaching the lost? Folks, the preacher can't do it all by himself. Personally, I mean, during my time, am I preaching the gospel? Absolutely, I'm preaching you know, when I'm behind the pulpit. Brother Hunter's preaching it when he's behind the pulpit. But also, daily, when I'm out in the community meeting people, I'm doing the very best that I can to make sure that I'm spreading the gospel message. But folks, I tell you, I can't do it by myself. I cannot do it by myself. I need you. I need my brothers and sisters in Christ. I need the church to help alongside me with this. Are we teaching the lost? Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 15, he says, So, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you. When you look at the context there, in Romans chapter 1, verse 14 through 16, I call it Paul's I am statements. You know, we're familiar with the I am statements that Jesus makes from the Gospel of John. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life and the way. Uh, and the list goes on. But Paul himself even had an I am statement. Romans chapter 1, verse 14 through 16. Three points right there that any preacher or teacher can preach on. Number one, verse 14, he says that I am a debtor. I am a debtor. Really, for, for Christ to take my spot, I mean, I, I, I can't owe him, I can't pay back, but what I can do is that I can preach the gospel, he says. I am a debtor to Jews and Gentiles, I'm a debtor to everyone to preach the gospel. And so because of that, I am, number two, verse 15, eager to preach the gospel to you. And when I do preach the gospel to you, Paul says, number three, verse 16 of Romans 1, I am not ashamed in doing it. I am not ashamed in doing it. Often those most obligated seem to be the least eager. And I often wonder why that is. We should be eager because of what the gospel will do for others, folks. It will save their souls. 
Remember, folks, when we are preaching the gospel, when we are evangelizing, we look not at people, but we look at souls. These aren't people that have a body with a soul. No, they are a soul with a body. We got to look past that, past their bodies, and look at their soul because that is what is on the line, folks. Eternity is at stake here. It is on the line. And we have got to be very eager because it will save their souls from the eternal torment in the fires of hell. It will give them also, when we preach the gospel with eagerness, it will give them in this life, it will give them strength in this life and prepare them for the life that is to come, folks. And so what are some practical ways to teach? What are some practical ways to evangelize? Well, I have five lists right here. Uh, I'm sorry, I, they probably look a little bit tiny. I apologize, but uh, I'll go ahead and just read them out to you. But one practical way is to learn how to turn casual conversations into spiritual ones. Jesus was the master at this. John chapter 4, verse 1 through 30, on his conversation that he has with the Samaritan woman. When you have time, folks, I want you to go and read John chapter 4, verse 1 through 30. And in his conversation with the Samaritan woman, I want you to notice the style and the method that Jesus is using. I want you to notice and point out how many times Jesus keeps taking her conversation and keeps turning it into a spiritual one. Jesus was the master at this, folks. And we may not be the master at it, but we have got to learn, learn on how we can be able to take ta casual conversations and turn it into spiritual ones. About a year and two months ago, October of 2019, I preached a lesson. Hopefully, if you remember, I preached a lesson on this, John chapter 4, verse 1 through 30. And looking at all the different ways on how Jesus turned the casual conversation into spiritual ones. And I had a really good um, friend of mine, well, he's still a friend of mine, and he's a great, uh, faithful, sound uh, uh, brother in Christ who's an outstanding gospel preacher who was talented at this. And I remember one time when we were out evangelizing, he came across a window washer and he was able to take that conversation that he had with the window washer and was able to turn it into a spiritual one. When he was asking about what the window washer was doing and what, I mean, if it's just water that he's using to wash the windows, the window washer said, no, uh, there's actually certain you know, chemicals that we use that uh, mixes within the water and it helps us to remove all those stains and blots. Well, my friend jumped to that and he said, well, you know, there's a chemical that's able to remove the stain and blots from your soul. And that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Wow. I thought that was impressive. And that has always stuck with me for the longest time. But there's many ways, and this was a method that was very effective and helpful back on the reservation, on the Navajo reservation. See, on the Navajo reservation, in their culture, the sacred animal was a sheep or a lamb. Well, we talked about it this morning, right? And so I would always use that. I would tell them saying that, well, have you ever heard about the lamb who's able to take away the sins that you have? And so, folks, things like that. We have got to be good listeners and be able to listen to what we're having uh, with people in our conversations and be able to find ways that we're able to easily turn them into spiritual ones. Number two, we also have resource handouts. Resource handouts, such as the pamphlets that the church building has right there in the entrance when you walk in. Folks, there's boxes and boxes of those things. And we can easily, every Sunday morning, just grab a handful of them. Each of us just grab a handful of them and just pass them out. Pass them out to your neighbors. Pass them out to people that you know in the community. Pass them out to whomever you see. You can just easily hand them one. We have good resources and good pamphlets that we can be able to use in our evangelistic outreach. Number three, we can easily invite others to Bible study and worship. Nothing wrong against that. In John chapter 1, verse 46, 
Nathanael asked, What good can come out of Nazareth? Philip said, Come and see. I love that. Philip came very excited. He was sharing with Nathaniel about the Messiah, who, uh, uh, whose name is Jesus, and he's from Nazareth. And he's like, whoa, huh, I know the town of Nazareth. Not many good things come out of there. I mean, what good can come out of Nazareth? Well, Philip said, come and see. Folks, sometimes a simple invite to have Bible study or to come to a worship service can be expressed in those three words. Come and see. Number four, we can have personal one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. Truthfully, that's my favorite one. Personal one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. Just as Priscilla and Aquila did with Apollos, Acts chapter 18, verse 26, we can do it today as well. Now, I understand that in the context there of Aquila and Priscilla, they were taking him aside and correcting him. But in that correction, it involved what? Basically, teaching him accurately of the scriptures, of what they were saying. Well, folks, that's a Bible study. <laughs> and so we can apply that principle for us today, is that when we are out teaching the lost and evangelizing and reaching out to them, personal one-on-one -on -one Bible studies is the best way. That is the best way, especially when you're away from all the distractions. It's just you and that soul that you have in front of you and with your Bible open. And it's very simple, folks, when you are teaching them about sin, about how sin has separated them from God, and what they can do, and what Jesus has done for them, and how they are to respond to it. Folks, you go to the book, chapter and verse right there, and then you have them read it out loud. Therefore, they're not just listening to what you say, they're listening to what the Word says. And therefore, they can't get angry with you. If they get angry, they're getting angry with what the truth says. And so, therefore, your conscience is clean. Your conscience is clear. You did your part in turning, uh, having them turn to their Bibles to book, chapter, verse, and to have them read it for themselves. Now, some may ask, well, what if they're not familiar with the Bible and they don't know book, chapter, verse? Well, you help them, obviously. That's easy answer. You, just, you help them. You help them turn to uh, the book and to the chapter and the verse, and then you just point it out to them. And you say, read it right there. So one-on-one -on -one Bible studies is a way, practical way to teach. And also, this is actually a practical way. Number five is, I'd say, a requirement. This one, I mean, all of it is basically a requirement. To teach the lost is a requirement. That is our duty, our job to do. But now, this one, I would say, is very essential. We can teach by our Christian walk. As I always say, sometimes the best sermon to give is the sermon you live. Practicing what we preach, folks. Living out our Christian walk. Walking in the light as Jesus is the light. When we walk with wisdom toward outsiders, knowing how to be able to respond and to give an answer, when we walk in wisdom toward outsiders, and they see the way that we live, we know that we are genuine, that we are not only just preaching, but we're also living it as well. And so, folks, those are just five ways, practical ways, on how to teach and to evangelize. Purpose number two that the church has is to do good works. And that is benevolence, folks. To do good works, benevolence. The New Testament church, throughout the book of Acts, we see that they helped the needy. When you look at Acts chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, Acts chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, it says, And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Claudius was the Roman emperor at the time. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. And of course, when you look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 through 4, 
Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed, Paul says, as I directed, that is what Paul says, it's apostolic authority, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Folks, this help was in direct response to the teaching of the apostles and serves as an example for all generations. Christians were taught to give to these congregational efforts, but they were also urged to be generous even in private ways. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. As we have opportunity, well, public opportunity, private opportunity, let us do good to all men, and especially those of the household of faith. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, James chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, and even 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. If any man sees that his brother is in need, and he has worldly goods to give to him, but he does not give to him, how does the love of God abide in him? 1 John 3, 17. I like this picture, by the way, because you see how it says love, but it's from the word benevolence. So benevolence, E-V-O-L, is love backwards. I always thought that was pretty neat and pretty interesting. But Jesus himself had taught that it is more blessed to give than to receive, Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Helping the needy is a part of being a model Christian and a model congregation of the New Testament church. As Christians, we must, learn to, uh, we must learn that giving financially for the progress of the cause of Christ and sharing our goods to help those in need ranks among the purest purposes of the church. For look what James says in James chapter 1, verse 17. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans, and the widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, to be specific in the context, remember, James is writing specifically to the Christians at the Church of Christ in Jerusalem. So here, this is benevolence toward the household of faith. Folks, Paul says especially, meaning that in priority, first and foremost, we must be benevolent to those of the household of faith. That is a rank among the purest purposes of the church. Purpose number tres, three, is to build up the members, which is edification. The New Testament church showed early growth both in number and in spirit. Its members continued in proper worship and study. Again, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves daily to the apostles' teaching. They came to be of one heart and soul, Acts 4, 32. And they grew in respect for God's will, Acts 5, 11. They let the word of God have a growing effect in their lives, Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And after the conversion of the terrible persecutor named Saul, the church was able to enjoy peace and edification for a time, Acts chapter 9, verse 31. The early Christians learned the truth about the welcoming of all people. As Peter was led to teach the first Gentile converts, which would be Cornelius and his family, Acts chapter 10. Now, of course, this change was very hard for the Jewish Christians at the time, but they learned... They learned that the gospel allowed no racial barriers. Acts chapter 11, verse 1 through 18. The church of Christ in Antioch was strengthened through times of study and questioning about doctrines and practices. Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, and verse 33 through 35. The church of Christ in Troas was serious about studying the word. 
The members were careful to worship together on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. This continued, this continued growth, study, and worship, and preaching brought about consistent edification that pleased the Lord. In the design of His church, Jesus had provided preachers, evangelists, missionaries, pastors, which would be the elders and the overseers, and teachers for this very purpose, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16. This purpose was not only given to the first century church, but also to the 21st century church as well. Folks, Jesus built only one church, and from what we study this evening, the church had a purpose to fulfill. And we see the New Testament church fulfilling its purpose. Purpose is, plural, I should say. And today in the 21st century, those purposes haven't changed at all. We are still fulfilling the purpose to evangelize, the purpose of doing good works, and the purpose of building up one another. If Paul was able, or one of the New Testament writers, now I don't, I don't want you, I just want you to answer this to yourself, okay? If Paul or one of the New Testament writers wrote a letter to the Church of Christ in Painburn in regards to fulfilling our purposes, what would the writer have to say? Something to think about. And as we look at the overall identification of the New Testament church, we see that the church had a pattern to follow. And the church today, the New Testament church today, still follows that same pattern. The pattern of leadership, the pattern of worship, and the pattern of salvation. And folks, that pattern has not changed whatsoever. For a person to be added to the church of Jesus Christ, the New Testament church, they must follow that same model and that same pattern on how they were saved in the New Testament. Hearing the word of God, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, repenting of their sins, confessing Him as Lord, Master, and Ruler of their life, and to be baptized into Him, following the gospel motto of the being buried and dying to self and being resurrected, Romans chapter 6, and then living faithfully to the day that you die. Are you a member? Have you been added? Let me reword that question. Have you been added? to the New Testament church. If you're attending a church somewhere else, are they following the pattern? Are they following the purposes? Are they fulfilling the purposes? Folks, if you're attending at a church and they're not following the pattern of worship, and they're not following the pattern of salvation, then can you say that they are the New Testament church? Well, if they're not following the pattern, and they're not fulfilling their purpose, then no, they're not the New Testament church. So if you're trying to find a church home, a church family, find one where the church belongs to Christ, and that they are following the pattern of worship, the pattern of leadership, the pattern of salvation, and that they are fulfilling the purposes of evangelizing, doing good works, and building up the brothers and sisters. If you can find a church that is doing just that in accordance to the pattern of the New Testament, then you'll be fine. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to go ahead and close this out in a word of prayer, and the lesson is yours. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you again so much of being able to take time to uh, study this um, a very basic message on now, how we can identify the one true church that your son Jesus built on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And Father, we, in the 21st century, we know that we're not a perfect congregation, but we do the very best that we can. We strive the very best that we can to be the New Testament church. We follow this pattern that you've laid out for us to the very best that we can. 
and we do the very best that we can on fulfilling the purposes of the New Testament church. And Father, we hope that all that we are doing is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We allow your word to be our guidance. We allow your word to be our compass, guiding us in the right direction where we ought to go. At this time, I'm very, uh, uh, very thankful for each and every brother and sister here at the Painburn Church of Christ. Knowing how much that they have truly helped me in my personal life, I hope that I, too, have been very uh, helpful and a wonderful asset into their life as well. We're all in this together as the family of God. I ask that you continue on being with each and every brother and sister. Bless them doubly. Watch over them always and keep them safe underneath the shelter of your wing. We thank you for all that you do. For it's our prayer through your son's name, Jesus Christ, who has made this all possible, our Lord, Savior, and Master. Amen. Thank you all again so much. Hope you all had a, a wonderful uh, Lord's Day, and I hope you enjoyed this message. I hope it was very helpful. And again, uh, this is great material. This is all from the Word of God that you can share with those out in the community as we continue on fulfilling our purposes that we are called to fulfill in the New Testament. If y'all have any questions, comments, concerns, encouragements, or anything whatsoever, please feel free to put it down in the comment section below. Other than that, if you need me, you know where to find me, you know how to get a hold of me, and have a wonderful, blessed evening and rest of the week. God be with all of you. Love each and every one of you. Have a good night.